Thank you for coming to our 2021 virtual conference, Environmental Justice in Southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Sarah Grady. I am the South Shore Regional Coordinator for the Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Partnership and Watershed Ecologist for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. This is session two, supporting public access to recreational waters. The Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts works to protect and improve the health of the waterways and watersheds of the region for people, wildlife, and the environment. We have multiple member organizations uh, listed here, all of whom contribute uh, ideas and time to try to meet these goals. Our conference and the Watershed Action Alliance at large has multiple sponsors and supporters. We would like to thank the Island Foundation, our Eagle level supporter, and the NSRWA, Horsley Witten Group, and Three Birds Consulting, our Osprey level sponsors. In addition, we have many other sponsors listed here, as well as individual donors that help us accomplish our work. If you'd like to be one of those individual donors, there is going to be a donation link in the chat box. Uh, so feel free to pick us some money. Before we get started, I would just like to do a land acknowledgement. Our speakers are coming from the lands of multiple uh, tribes and native peoples within southeastern Massachusetts, including the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, the Nauset, and the Narragansett. Before we get started, I just want to give you a couple of tips for using Zoom. Uh, this is a webinar, so you are not going to be able to be seen or heard, but you should be able to hear our speakers and, of course, any slides they're sharing. Please use the Q&A to submit questions to speakers. Do not raise your hand. Um, use the Q&A, which has uh, the two little dialogue boxes. Uh, if you have technical issues and technical issues only, uh, you can use the chat. That's also where you will see posts with links to resources. The other attendees are not going to be able to see your chat messages or your questions until they are answered. Again, we're, we're not going to be raising hands. This uh, webinar is going to be recorded, so it will be available afterward. And in addition, you'll be receiving a PDF with many of the resources that have been mentioned throughout. So now um, I would like to begin our uh, session two, supporting public access to recreational waters. Um, we have three fantastic speakers with us today. We have uh, Katie Canfield from the US EPA, and we have Melissa Ferretti from the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe, and Vivian Ortiz, who serves on the Advisory Council of the Neponset River Watershed Association and is a member of the Neponset River Greenway Council. Um, and I also just want to uh, apologize. We have, um, <laughs> in our multiple sessions, we have two Kate slash Katie's who both work at the EPA. Today's speaker is Kate Mulvaney. Uh, not Katie Canfield. All right. Um, and with that, um, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, who is Melissa Ferretti. Melissa Ferretti is the chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe uh, here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, she's raised in Cedarville, she's lived on the ancestral homelands of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe all her life. Uh, she does a lot of volunteer work in the community to a uh, better life for the Wampanoag tribe. Um, and she has a lot of fantastic information uh, and she loves to educate uh, the non-native public about the tribe and its rich and well-documented history. So I'm going to stop sharing um, and let her uh, Tell us all about that. Well, Waniki Saka. Thank Saka. you, Melissa. Uh, Natasubis, Melissa. Um, hi, I am called Melissa, and I'm really honored to be here today. 
um, to just to talk a little bit about um, environmental justice, um, otherwise known as EJ, and uh, supporting access to recreational waterways. So let me start my slide share. You know, I, I think about the term the term EJ and in itself, as we learned, and if you were able to attend the first session, EJ has many, it, it has many parts. It's just a smaller sliver of a much larger conversation, as we all know. Um, but when it comes to access to waterways and indigenous people, you know, we as indigenous people know well that there is very little knowledge um, about Aboriginal rights and what exactly that even means. Um, indigenous populations may in fact um, be the most misunderstood than most populations when it comes to these rights. So thousands of years of stewardship since time immemorial, Wampanoag people have roamed, occupied, lived, died, and survived on these lands now called Southeastern Massachusetts and Eastern Rhode Island. Um, so supporting public access to recreational waterways um, for the tribes, it's not so much for recreation, it's for sustenance and, and food sovereignty. So, you know, the Herring Pond uh, Wampanoag tribe, we, we remain deeply connected culturally and spiritually to our homelands and to the waters, uh, particularly our people have continued to fish, hunt, trap, and gather for thousands of years here on these lands. The lands of indigenous people are most likely to be mismanaged, neglected, and targeted for projects that are disastrous for the environment. The dispossession, treaty violations, Supreme Court rulings, and the desecration of sacred sites, uh, pollution, and so much more um, is just ongoing. So for myself, uh, Growing up in Cedarville, as Sarah had mentioned, raised by an elder of my tribe, Verna Harding, shown here, her sister Phyllis, just 100 years old, and Uncle Tunny. These three had probably hunted together more often than not back when they were young. They're all, no, both three of them are no longer with us, obviously, but we, we continue to remember the traditions that were important to them, and that's, that's very important to me. So growing up, raised by Verna, um, I mean, I witnessed firsthand uh, as a small child what it was like to be a survivalist and what Verna would call living off the fat of the land. Um, fishing, hunting, gathering, farming, um, cooking, canning, uh, preparing game. It was taught and observed by my sister and I at a very incredibly young age as Verna and all the other members of the tribe we're, we're always fishing and hunting and such. So Verna was born in 1905. Um, she was an amazing, strong and proud woman. She was a hard worker and she has been known to some of the other uh, cousins I've spoke to as she could outwork two men very easily. Uh, she was one of the first women to ever work at the Quincy shipyard along with several other Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe women, including Aunt Phyllis and several others. And um, as a small children, you know, we would listen intently to her stories and that her days of survival when they had to travel to get access to water and to other routes um, in what she would call um, horse and buggy when she was in school in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Um, so Verna, she didn't drive. So, uh, and I don't think I ever asked her why, but we didn't have a car growing up with Verna. We, we relied on the aunts and uncles and the other tribal members would take us out and Verna would shop and do her thing. But I think for myself, um, the most important childhood memories for me and the adventures that I cherished the most were the ones where we were on foot going through the paths and gaining access, whether it was a trip just down to Carter's Bridge to go swimming or fishing, out behind Bruno's Corner to get blueberries or other berries uh, in search of lady slippers or mayflowers. Um, once they were extinct, obviously we didn't do that anymore. 
and Verna knew that as well. Uh, one of the fonder memories and uh, more dangerous ones, I guess I would call it, would be uh, crossing four lanes of traffic to get from Cedarville over to the other side of the highway so that we could get down and through the paths down there for whatever it would be for berries, fishing, or just a simple cut off so we could get to Carter's Bridge for fishing. So um, one of another one that's very important uh, for access and sovereignty was Verna would walk us down through from Cedarville, whoever, I apologize if you don't know Cedarville, but if you start in Cedarville, you can walk Route 3A and you can go down Carter's Bridge or, I mean, you can go down Route 3, but you can cut off onto Ellisville Road. So we were very young. We would have several jugs of water, as many we could carry, and Verna would walk us all the way down there to that spring because to Verna, um, that was the best water you could get anywhere. So to get fresh, clean drinking water, we would walk two miles and then two miles back. Um, generally, Verna was smart though. She would have us walk back 3A so that she knew somebody would drive by that knew us and give us a ride. So over the years, um, these places that we would go to fish and um, to pick slowly and slowly disappeared over time. The places were no longer accessible or they were limited. Um, Herring Pond at Carter's Bridge, we grew up there our whole lives. You could sit on the beach, you could swim, you could fish, you could do whatever you wanted. And then it came a time where someone bought something and claimed that they owned the sand at Carter's Bridge. At that time, I don't think we realized how strong of a right, the rights that we did have. And um, Verna would often fuss when somebody would try to remove us from where we were or if she was cutting through. Uh, she may often use some colorful metaphors because that was just Verna and she knew her, she knew her right and she was gonna stick to it. But slowly and slowly, as older she became, the less likely we were to, to make those trips. And obviously the less likely we were to even be able to access those places. So um, as a coastal tribe, we know that any environmental injustices and threats um, to our community are potential issues that could affect all communities. So it's crucial that I, we um, as a tribe, educate the public on these type of things. So moving forward, what are Aboriginal rights? It's a lot, right? Uh, use of fructory, sorry, let me go back. So anyhow, um, Aboriginal rights, what are they? So there's many case laws that we'll get to later, but um, a lot of people don't realize that people, that indigenous people even have this right. Um, so Native American tribes have retained the Aboriginal rights to hunt, fish, trap, gather, unless abrogated by treaty, abandoned or extinguished by statute meaning some tribes in order to possibly, just for an example, might in order to get recognition in their federal, federal recognition, they may agree to get rid of some of those rights. Or treaty might've said that you, you get this, but you can no longer, you no longer have access to the fishing areas. But in the Wampanoag people and the Indians in Massachusetts, so they call us, um, we have the right and we've never, it's, we're in unceded territory. So the right to resort to the regular fishing places is part of a larger right, it's possessed by the Indians. And there is not a shadow of impediment in which we were not uh, much less necessary in existence. It's doing it to me again. So, no, we never ceded our rights. We have usufruct rights, use and enjoy, and the rights, are inherent. So in 1982, um, I'm not sure exactly what, who was the speaker there, but this is, this is what they call the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts Aboriginal Rights Proclamation. I'm just gonna read the first two off for you. And these are all things that you can look back later. We're gonna share this PDF. So if there's any resources or something you want to learn more about, you'll have them here. So first, um, this is a resolution from 1982. First one, whereas Indians in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 
have an ancient and aboriginal claim to the wildlife of this land as a source of food for sustenance for their families. Whereas this ancient and aboriginal right has been recognized by treaties, including the Falmouth Treaty, and this ancient and aboriginal right claim has been recognized by legislative enactments in 1795 and so on. So I won't read the whole thing, but I, I suggest everyone take a peek at that and learn a little bit. Some of the language um, isn't quite as, um, I don't know how to say that, but some of the language in my opinion, I think should be changed, but it's something and it's the Commonwealth acknowledging such. So how can you support public access? Well, I would think supporting the public access from indigenous perspective would be to begin to start understanding the human and inherent rights to protect the marine areas and our ancient connection to the local that we have to the lands and recognize that relationship between natives and lands in the sea. Case law, these are minor, this is just a few case law. Um, indigenous people do not need permission to gain access. This is one of the biggest things that the public may not understand. So do not need permission to gain access to the sea, local marine areas, as there is a, a continuous ancient easement that allows tribes to walk or cut through any property to access natural resources. Do we do that? Not always. Conflict, in order to, con you know, to avoid conflict, you, we may go around. But the short answer is sometimes, yes, we might cut through someone's property to access uh, the, the sea or to gather or to hunt um, and all of that. So these are just some case law that you can maybe look up look up later. Um, one very important was the Maxim and Green decision. Um, there was a couple of different suits regarding um, my cousin and some of those. So I would suggest take this later and, and you know, maybe look at some of the case law and it'll help you understand why um, indigenous people have these rights and why the courts agree, agree so. So the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, otherwise known as UNDRIP, what is the UN? I could, this, this is obviously a much larger conversation um, because as you can see, it has 24 preambular paragraphs and there's 46 total articles. So the declaration, it's an international human rights instrument and it was adopted by the UN General Assembly over two decades of, after two decades of negotiation. It's really a set of minimum standards of treatment of indigenous people and states that the rights contained within it constitute minimum standards for survival, dignity, and well being of indigenous people in the world. As I said, there's 24 preambular, 46 articles. Oh, go back. Sorry. So Melissa, article, just so you know, you have one minute left. Yes, I'm almost there too. It's perfect. Um, article 29 it states, indigenous people have the right to the conservation and protection of the environment and productive capacity of their lands and territories and resources. States shall establish, implement assistance programs for indigenous people. Much larger conversation. The link will be in the back. I advise everyone to look it up. Look it up. This is just a quick map of the Herring Pond Reservation lands. You see Herring River, and you can see all these waterways is where we would wanna be accessing in this whole region. And move on, just a quick, um, our, our meeting house then and now, um, built from an 80, 1838 petition to the Commonwealth. We still have control of that today. Um, our tribal council members, committee members, and there's our group. And thank you so much for listening today. Thank you, Melissa. That was wonderful. And it's great to be aware of that, you know, as we as we ourselves are, go everyone's going to the coast uh, to just kind of give that some thought. Um, all right, um, we're gonna be saving our questions to the end. So um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker, Vivian Ortiz. 
Vivian Ortiz uh, is um, at the Neponset River Watershed Association. She's on the advisory council. Um, and she's had uh, an extensive uh, history of helping out multiple community organizations around Boston, particularly in the neighborhoods of Dorchester, Hyde Park, and Mattapan. Uh, she's also a member of the Neponset River Greenway Council. Um, and she's going to be telling us a great story about a seven and a half mile rail trail along the Neponset River. Vivian. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to have me join you today to share my story. My name is Vivian Ortiz and I do live in Mattapan, one of the most Southern neighborhoods in Boston. First of all, I'm just gonna share a little bit about myself. I am from El Paso, Texas, and I moved to the East Coast about 14 years ago to go to school in New York City. I moved to Boston in 2009 for a job and then in Mattapan about eight years ago. Soon after I moved into Mattapan, I found out that there was a walk that was going to be taking place in a couple days um, near, my, near my home. Um, I went on the walk and was really, really shocked to find that there was a path that was going to be built right near my home. Um, a friend that has lived in Mattapan since childhood um, vaguely remembered hearing something about the fact that this was going to be built, but it was something that her parents um, may have been involved with when she was much younger. So she wasn't really aware of it either. So really that's kind of where my story begins. This is a map of the Neponset River Greenway that Sarah made a mention to. The two stars that are on there are just, I wanna show you guys how close the entrance of the newest part of the section is to my house. The star on the right is where I live and then the other star is right at the entrance of the, the newest part of the section. So this trail runs along the Neponset River from the Martini Shell in Hyde Park on the long Truman Parkway in Milton, Mattapan Station to Central Ave along the trolley, through Lower Mills, near the Baker Chocolate Factory, to Pope John Paul Park, which is visible from 93 South um, near the Ashmont exit, then under the Neponset Bridge that crosses over into Quincy, and then to Senator Finnegan Park in Port Norfolk. I wanted just to make sure that you guys could understand some of those communities may be familiar to you and others might not, but I just wanted to let you know the expansiveness of, of this trail. But the part that I'm going to concentrate on today is the newest section, which is from Central Avenue in Milton to Mattapan Station. It was opened in May of 2017, but it took a long time to get to that point. Like all projects of this type, they take a long time, the sections are broken up, and a lot of it has to do with funding and the fact that they just cannot, they don't have the capacity to do all of it at one point. But this section had an added obstacle, and it was racism. Um, this was before my time, but when the Department of Conservation and Recreation had secured the funding to complete this section, during the public meeting process, DCR presented multiple design options for the community to give input on. To build it all in Mattapan, to build it all in Milton, or some combination of that. At the meetings, neighbors from Milton voiced their concerns about having the trail so close to their homes because of something to the effect of, again, this is hearsay that I have, but sirens being heard from Mattapan. Really, that was code for saying, we don't want Black people to be in our backyard to be that close. So at that point, DCR said, look, we've got the money, we need to spend it now. Y'all need to figure out this out and we're gonna move on. So basically they jumped that entire section and built the part of the trail that runs along Blue Hill Avenue and Truman Parkway in Milton to Hyde Park. About five years later, funding was found, a design was chosen to build part of it in Milton build a bridge over the Neponset into Mattapan and then have it continue over to the MBA, MBTA station in Mattapan. So the, again, those are the stars that show you the, how close it is that I am from, the, from my home um, to the entrance of the path that's nearest me. And it's about two tenths of a mile to the front from my front door. Okay. So until the trails opening in 2017, this is how you were welcomed from Dorchester and Lower Mills 
into Milton and Mattapan. So it was just a space that had a fence in it. You could no longer go um, at that point. And I always just wondered, you know, why is that? And now I knew after having gone on that on that walk that there was a plan to extend this. So um, just to kind of familiarize you all with it the the trolley stop this is a trolley stop on central ave so from the way that these pictures are taken milton is to the left and mattapan is on the right for those of you that don't know the neponset river is what divides milton and boston okay um, back to that walk that i had mentioned when um, i found out that the path was going to be built i wanted to know more i was directed to vivian morris a mattapan resident that had founded a group called Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition. They were really interested in the trail because part of their mission is to get more people in Mattapan to become more physically active. Vivian had been involved with a group of neighbors from Dorchester, Hyde Park, Mattapan Milton, and now Quincy that had been meeting for years to advocate for the completion of this trail. That group is the Neponset River Greenway Council. So, the flyer that's on the left here was for a walk that the Boston Natural Areas Network, which was the precursor to the Greenway Council and Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition had put together to get residents to come out and check out what the trail was going to look like. Um, I remember going to that. I was one of very, very few residents that had come to that. And that was something that really bothered me and it kind of intrigued me. Why was it that we weren't getting my neighbors to come out and, and be really excited about having this wonderful amenity that was gonna get built? So the picture on the right was the elected coming to Mattapan. This was December the 22nd of 2014. For the groundbreaking ceremony, um, Governor Patrick, um, who had lived in Mattapan at that time, had secured funding to make sure that the missing link would be completed. It was one of the last actions that he took while he was still governor. And this ceremony took place nine days before he left office. So in the spring of 2015, the construction team moved into the field that abuts the entrance to the trail. And being a nosy Nelly that I am, I introduced myself to the team. And, and the reason I did this was because of that discovery that I had made. It was really disheartening. While I thought that the trail was going to be like amazing and wonderful, the conversation amongst my neighbors wasn't the same. They weren't sharing the same sentiment. I started hearing that folks hadn't asked for this path. There were concerns that gentrification was going to take was taking place. And the property values were going to go up on their homes and they were really concerned about that and they were going to be forced to leave. Um, and basic, I also heard that, you know, from folks that black people don't, we don't go out for walks. So why are we going to want this? Right? So I didn't spend a lot of time in the outdoors growing up, but around the time that this was all happening, I had started riding a bicycle and was absolutely terrified to ride on the streets. And I really saw this trail as an opportunity to have a safe space for my neighbors and I to be able to walk and bike. So the pick on the top was a day when a group of residents, we were working on an initiative in Mattapan through Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition, um, went over to the trailer where the, 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 the bridge was getting built or was going to get built. All of the construction was taking place there. And I asked, um, we, we invited ourselves because we wanted to add a personal touch to the right, DCR, technically written flyers that were going to be passed around uh, on this particular street. Um, and we wanted to be a little bit more involved in that. So we said to DCR, basically I said to them, we're the ones that need to pass out these flyers because you don't look like the neighborhood and they're not going to like welcome you to come in and, and have this conversation with you. So the street needed to be car free in order for the um, semis that were carrying all of the parts to build this bridge um, could be make it make it down that street and be able to get to that to that point. So, um, you know, we we were the ones that did the door knocking. Um, and that evening, when the trailer started coming in, it was this convoy that was coming from New York. They had sent a police officer to be at the intersection to be able to make sure that the trucks could come in safely. And so, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to see how this was going to be. And I remember the officer from the Boston Police Department was very surprised that all of the cars on the street were actually able to be removed. 
And he was like really shocked because he said, you know, this never happens. We do these all the time, but we never have actually gotten like 100% compliance with all of the neighbors um, taking part on this. And I basically said to them, it's like, because you guys were the ones that did the door knocking. If you don't ask the neighbors to come out and do that and explain to people why it is that this is happening, then you're not gonna get that participation. And then the other picture was from the morning when um, some of us gathered at Mattapan Station um, for a really spectacular event. So in order for the MBTA, because this is all these different state agencies, um, DCR that does parks and the trail runs along, like I said, the trolley. So they also needed to make sure that MB MBTA was involved in this. So in order for the, the trail to run over Mattapan Station, there needed to be a, a canopy bridge that was built. And because of the work that the Greenway Council had established for a long time with the folks from DCR um, and are asking and insisting that they let us know when major events like this were taking place, this was a group of neighbors and I that were out there really early in the morning. It was really chilly, like seven o'clock in the morning to watch the canopy bridge being lifted over the trolley tracks. So we've got an elected official, we've got our police captain, in, and then the re some of the folks are members of the Neponset River Greenway Council. Others are just neighbors from Mattapan that were out there because we wanted to see this. But, okay, so we had some folks that were involved, some people that were getting excited about it, but it still wasn't enough. So when the trail actually was open, it was magical. It was just Oh my God, amazing. It was like a sanctuary within the city. You could walk along it. You wouldn't hear any of the busyness on River Street, any of those sirens that the folks from Milton had expressed concern about. Um, and then it was soon after that, that I became aware of NEPRA, the Neponset River Watershed Association. I knew nothing about this. I was a person from the desert, didn't know anything about healthy rivers or anything like that, but I'm always really curious and really excited about learning. So I found out that every year, NEPRA, along with DCR, had been holding these cleanups of the river. I was shocked. I had no idea that this much pollution and this much disrespect had been taking place along this river. Many, you know, for years and years and years, Baker Chocolate Factory, paper mills, all of these industries had been all along the river and a lot of dumping had taken place. But then there was another huge problem. There was a lot of dumping of tires into the river. So in an effort continuing to try to get folks to be engaged and to be involved through that, that um, initiative that we were working on, it was like, guys, we need to come out and do this river, right? And folks were like, what? We're going to clean a river? I'm not getting in there. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what's been in there. And I noticed that it was kind of like a cultural thing too, that if you were not connected to the river, if that was not something that you had had the opportunity to experience, it was not something that you likely were really wanting to get involved in. But I was like, come on, guys, let's go try it let's go do it and so now over the years now we've started to see more of our neighbors becoming involved becoming excited becoming concerned letting other people know about the responsibilities that we have to the environment and even though we were not the ones that necessarily did the wrongs we want this to become a healthy river we want our families to be able to go on there we want the other folks in other parts of the community that are canoeing in it that are enjoying it we want our families to also have that opportunity so these are some pictures of neighbors getting involved the one on the bottom right is the most recent one you can see that the person in that picture is wearing a mask because we did do a cleanup we just it was uh, nepra made sure in dcr that it was a smaller group of people that were involved but um, the work continues and we wanted to make sure that we were doing what we could um, for our part so now with my neighborhood association, it's something that I had been putting on the calendar for years, but I'm very persistent. And it was like one of these years, I know that we're going to get um, folks to be involved. The picture on the left were all those tires. Every year it's like 70, 80 tires that, that get pulled out. There are still tires within the river. That's a whole group of students from like Wentworth College. And I kind of guilted my neighbors into this. And I said, you guys, 
there are none of us from this neighborhood. There are no black people that are coming out there. And these are communities that are coming to take care of something that we need to do. So the guilt worked. So now we've got people that are coming out on a more regular basis. We're getting more folks to come out and, and do walks through the Greenway Council and everything, working to get folks um, excited about this during COVID, you know, having opportunities to get out, being out and exploring outdoors and everything. So these are some pictures of just different communities, different people that are out using it. Um, so many of our shared paths throughout are always referred to as bike paths, right? We don't have a very large community of folks that are riding bicycles in Mattapan. It's something that I'm really, really working to change. Um, my day job is with the Safe Routes to School program, which is a statewide initiative um, to get more kids walking and biking. I actually right now I'm using a space in Weymouth because I've been here all day doing an arrival and dismissal observation and doing a walk assessment so we can get kids in this community walking. But um, Part of it is we need to change the language. So when we're talking about these paths, these shared spaces, these rail trails, let's try to do a better job to not refer to them as bike paths because when we refer to them as bike paths, all of these other individuals that are pictured here think this isn't a space for me. I don't belong there, right? These are folks that live within my neighborhood that have either found the path on their own or whatever reason they're out there, we need to acknowledge that and we need to continue inviting these. The third picture was about three weeks after the path had opened in 2017. And I was just like, come on folks, let's get out here, let's do it, let's enjoy it. They then have brought, this is a group of ESL students from a, a community center in Mattapan. They had no idea this was happening. Amazing. There was a gentleman there that said, I'm a photographer. I am so looking forward to being able to bring brides and grooms out here to take pictures of this amazing space. So it's the reason I'm talking about this and you're wondering, this is about access to riverways and things is because access isn't just about actually getting in the water. It's bringing communities to these spaces and what we can do. Um, in the past, I used to get really frustrated. We're almost done? Yeah. Um, you, this yeah is you're just about done, my yeah. Last Thank slide, you. my last slide. So um, I used to get really upset because I wanted all these folks to come out and do all of these things. I've kind of changed that. So if it's one person, one person at a time that we can get involved, that we can share that information and let them know, pay it forward. You know this is amazing. Bring somebody else out to this space, whatever space, whatever opportunity, and they will come. We need to invite people. We need to build awareness. We can't make assumptions that they know about this. I've made reference to this amazing bridge a couple of times. This is the Harvest River Bridge. Naponset means Harvest River. So DCR was wonderful in, in giving this the appropriate name. It's an all season bridge and it's an all time bridge. So thank you again for the opportunity. And I look forward to any questions or comments that you might have afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. It's always wonderful to hear such a great success story and, and think about all of those happy people <laughs> getting to uh, have all that access to nature right in there. We're not room. done. It's a <laughs> it's a project that continues, but yes. yes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And we're gonna, now we're going to move on to our last uh, and third speaker, Kate Mulvaney. <laughs> um, who is an environmental sociologist uh, in EPA's Office of Research and Development in Rhode Island. And her work focuses on the social value of coastal water quality, as well as public engagement with science and decision making. And she's going to be telling us about how social science, data collection, and hearing from those most impacted can aid in making public access areas to the water welcoming and available to BIPOC communities. And we'll learn what BIPOC means. So thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to the Watershed Action Alliance for having me today. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining. I think there's just so much room left um, in discussion and, and research um, to really understand what coastal access looks like and, and understanding some of the environmental justice concerns. Um, I particularly am really honored to be on the panel of Vivian and Melissa today. Uh, the power of their narratives um, and their insights about um, barriers to access um, are that it's just very powerful data 
Um, and in, in terms of understanding that there's a, there's a lot um, that to limitations, um, that it's not just uh, some of the things that maybe we think of off the cuff, uh, but in order to change access um, and, and equitability in access, um, that there's uh, a lot of a lot of social work uh, that we have to do as people uh, too. Uh, what I'm about to provide to you is, is a quantitative analysis. It's very data heavy, um, but I see it as a really good complement uh, to those narratives um, and, the, and the insights that they provide. I am a social scientist. I work at the um, EPA's research lab uh, in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Um, this work was led or co-led by Julia Twitchell, who's at the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. Um, and we also worked with Nate Merrill and Justin Bosquin, who are social scientists at the EPA as well. Um, uh, today's presentation, I'll go through um, some of the value of coastal access and recreation, although I, I won't do a better job than Melissa and Vivian just did. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the geography of Rhode Island, uh, just because that pr provides the foundation for the work um, and the study that we did. I'll present some of the results of the research, um, as well as some of the implications of what that looks like. Uh, from last week and from earlier today, um, we've learned and we, uh, we, we know that environmental justice is really multifaceted, uh, that, there's a, uh, that there's a lot of different things that it takes um, for, for us to have um, kind of a just environment. Uh, the particular aspect that this work uh, that, I'm, that I talk about um, here um, is, is considered distributional justice. And distributional justice is the idea that benefits and burdens of um, environmental resources are distributed fairly among all people. And all people meaning um, regardless of gender, age, uh, national, national origin, um, sexual orientation, social class, race, race ethnicity, or more. Um, his, historically, we've kind of um, often looked at environmental justice or distributional justice through a lens of disamenities. Um, so, uh, what's the kind of proportionate burden of bad things, uh, of different types of pollution, um, of where different types of hazards or um, contaminated sites are located. Uh, but we're increasingly also thinking about that in terms of how we allocate good things or amenities. Um, how do we, where are parks and green spaces located? Uh, where have we been putting restoration projects as we, as we improve the environment? And then today, coastal access is, um, is what I'll talk to you about more. Uh, I suspect if um, any of you are joining a webinar for the Watershed Action Alliance that uh, you think water is important uh, and that there's good reasons to access it. Um, we, we access uh, coastal areas for any number of different reasons, uh, for recreation, uh, physical and mental health reasons, um, for experiences with nature, um, places to meet up with family or friends um, or for cultural values. Uh, resource harvest, either for substance, uh, for recreation, for um, kind of industrial harvest, and more. So there's a lot of reasons that we want to get to the coasts. Um, but there's also a number of things that impact access um, uh, for recreation and, and just in general. Uh, so um, when, when we're looking at kind of the basis of accessibility, uh, whether or not there's public access to a site, who is it? Who is included in the public um, that is allowed to access that site? How much uh, time does it take to get to a location? How much does it cost to enter? Um, is there um, transportation to get there? If you have a car, you uh, could get to more places than if you do if you don't have a car. Um, if a if a location isn't on a bike stop, or isn't on bus stop, um, or if um, there's no place to lock up your bike when you get there. Um, when, we're, when we're thinking about access, um, it's kind of in, uh, in tune that uh, those living closer to a spot are more likely to go. Um, and that's like all things being equal, you would choose to go to a closer place because it would cost you less time and money to go there. You would go farther to see a friend or to see a, I don't know, a special bird that is there. Um, but if all things are equal, you would try to spend less time going there and more time being there. My slide is not forwarding. Okay, it just forwarded. Um, so the, another aspect that impacts access is site quality. 
Um, and so there's any number of impairments that make it so a site is less desirable or, or unusable for what you wanted to do. Uh, so if you wanted to swim, but the beach is closed because of a bacterial closure, um, then you wouldn't be able to do what you wanted to do. If, um, if it's closed for shellfish harvest, you wouldn't be able um, to, to go gather there. Um, if, uh, if you were hoping to go boating and there's too much uh, macroalgae or seaweed there. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can be impaired um, based on the site quality um, that affect um, the value of your experience for you. And then finally, at the root of our question is, um, does, is who you are, does that impact your access and recreation on the coast? Uh, so our fundamental uh, research question is, do different demographic groups have equitable opportunity to access and recreate on the coast in Rhode Island. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick primer on Rhode Island um, uh, just because it, it provides this background context. Uh, so here's our, our mighty small state uh, with the city of Providence and the um, pretty close to the Northern part of Narragansett Bay. That's the lighter chunk in the back in the middle there. Um, our Rhode Island similar to almost all coastal states has high coastal um, property values, um, in, in particular in our state along our, our southern open water facing areas. Um, so much higher median home values, which already are a way, um, a, 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 a method of exclusion sometimes for people in terms of um, being able to afford to live in a place. Uh, Rhode Island's population is 74% um, non-Latinx white um, self-identified. Um, and this is higher than the national average of 60%. Um, so the, the, the proportion of the population is, is a higher proportion uh, non-Latinx white. Um, uh, many people of color in R Rhode Island uh, live in our urbanized areas. Um, again, up in the, the kind of greater Providence metro area. Um, the highest proportion of, of population um, that identify as either black or, or Latinx um, are in the, the heavily urbanized um, Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls areas. Um, the greatest proportion of the populations who identify as Asian are within a, a more um, suburban radius of Providence. Um, and then those who identify as Native American or, or Indigenous American, the highest proportion are in uh, the southern part of the state, the um, kind of the ancestral um, home of Narragansett, of the Narragansett, as well as the current um, site of the Narragansett um, tribe reservation. Um, when we're talking about public access in Rhode Island, there's more than 400 public access points. Uh, there's all sorts of different types of public access. Um, uh, they include things like uh, paths to shore and then other types that have amenities like boat ramps, fishing sites, uh, scenic viewpoints, places to go swimming, um, public parks, conservation areas. Um, and of those 400 public sites, um, there's a range in things that um, activities that people can do, but there's also a range in water quality. Um, the map that you see on the right, the maroonish purple color, indicates um, areas that have had um, some identified water quality impairment um, by the state. So they're on, uh, for people that care about such things, 303D lists, um, or they have conditional or permanently closed shellfish. Um, and so you, you'll see kind of a divide between areas um, that just have some water quality impairment or places that have no water quality impairments. And we consider these, the, we're, we're calling these our cleanest spots. So um, it's not that all, um, that many of the other spots aren't, Aren't, don't have many other good um, ways to access them and, and, and opportunities at them. It's just there's kind of a value for, for having no impairments. A quick shout out uh, to Julia, who is uh, the co-author on this work um, in, at the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. They produced an absolutely beautiful story map. Um, so if you Google Narragansett Bay Estuary Program recreational use story map, you can learn all about um, what re recreational use looks like in Rhode Island. Um, and, it's, and, and it's really, really good. So um, everyone should look there. Um, my slides aren't forwarding again. Let's see. Um, so when we get there, the next slide is that there are 30 uh, public beaches uh, in Rhode Island that are town or state beaches. Um, those town or state beaches um, are, are often considered kind of some of our like highest amenity access points. 
um, you know, people will travel farther to go to those than, than maybe some of the other types of recreational site. Um, and you'll see here um, that within Narragansett Bay, all of, all of those beaches have at least some history of closures um, or impairments, um, whereas those um, outward facing beaches um, at the southern part of our coast, mostly over um, on the western uh, part of Rhode Island in Washington County, uh, but one access point also in Little Compton um, on the eastern side. So back, back to our research question, um, based off of the, that kind of geography of Rhode Island of where there's closures and where people live, uh, do different demographic groups have equitable opportunity to access and recreate on the coast in Rhode Island? Uh, to, to, to understand this or to look at this one, one way, uh, we used equity mapping methods. Um, and so for that, we really depend on census block groups. So census block groups are um, kind of towns broken up um, into smaller pieces based on population density. So they're not all the same size chunks. Um, it's based on how many people live in those chunks. And we use that to look at how far people have to travel uh, to get to public access points. Um, and so we looked at how far they had to get to the nearest beach, just one beach, um, or to the, to the average of 10 public access points. And then we looked at how far they had to get to get to the cleanest beaches, um, so those with no impairments, um, or uh, the nearest clean uh, 10 public access points, um, meaning no impairments as well. Uh, for folks who care about such things, we did a linear regression. And that means um, that we hold, that we look at a lot of different factors that might change the travel distance. Um, and we try to hold those constants. So you're, um, you're, you're, so you're able to try to look at just what is the difference um, in travel distance based on race, race and ethnicity um, and, and trying to hold those other things constant. Um, and the other things, some of the other things we looked at were income, home value, unemployment, uh, seasonal housing, if someone owned a vehicle or not, how urbanized the areas were, um, population density, and then which county they were in. Uh, so the result of our, our work uh, looking at coastal access is that the average distance um, that anyone has to go from um, the different census block groups is six miles uh, to the nearest 10 coastal access points. Um, census block groups with higher, uh, higher proportion um, residents who identify as white, um, on average had to travel about 0.18 miles less to get to any coastal access point or to their, their nearest 10. Um, the increases in um, proportion of population that were black or Latinx um, had a, a, like a relatively higher, uh, relatively farther distance to get to those coastal access points. Um, so like a negative here is, is a good thing, meaning you don't have to travel as far uh, to get to uh, uh, coastal access points. Um, we also looked at the distance to the cleanest points, so people have to travel farther to get, on average, to get to um, cleanest points, um, and, and the relationships get even bigger there, um, where uh, increases in uh, proportion of the population and identify as white, um, so it's, it's more than half a mile closer, where um, proportion of populations that were Black or Latinx um, had to, had to try out travel over a mile farther um, to get to those cleanest points uh, than average. Just to know uh, again, you have a minute left. Okay, again, we looked at beaches um, and the beaches um, had held for the same relationship. Um, so white populations um, had to travel less far um, relative to the mean and then black and Latinx populations had to travel farther um, to get to, uh, to, to beaches and to cleanest beaches. We looked at, um, we also looked at distances for um, indigenous American um, and uh, Asian populations, but there were no statistical relationships. Um, those distances, um, to think about them, you multiply them by cost. It costs, far, it costs more uh, to go farther. Um, and so that's um, the, at the kind of the root of what we're looking at. Um, so to, uh, to kind of wrap it up, um, what, what we used was, was just looking at kind of travel distances to look at um, equality or equitability and access uh, to resources. Um, and so with a, a move towards equality, everyone would be the same distance from access points. Um, so could we provide more public access points and where would we put those? 
Um, but, but pushing that further is equitability, that everyone would have a fair chance to get to a high quality shoreline given different resources. Um, can we update transportation, parking, fee permit structures? Can we improve the environment at existing sites or future access points? Um, and ultimately, can we restore coastal sites to enrich rather than to exclude? Uh, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me um, or Julia at the National um, the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and now we are going to uh, try to answer some questions. So we're gonna, we've been getting some questions in the Q&A. Um, so I will um, address those to the various panelists from today. So you can all uh, show yourselves um, and let's uh, see what we have here. So um, for, uh, for Vivian, um, really, so this, uh, Marissa says, um, really awesome that you and others went to your community to hand out the flyers and gather community participation. How can governments and organizations have trustworthy community members involved in community participation on a regular basis for these types of projects? And maybe include funds and jobs for the specific reasons written into grants. Okay, um, thank you, Marissa, for your um, question. Um, ours was a unique, the whole Naponset River Greenway Council is kind of a unique organization um, because it was just something that neighbors, um, well, through the Boston Natural Areas Network. So I'm thinking neighborhood associations can reach out. In this case, it was DCR and letting them know, you know, we, we want to be involved in this process. This is something that's happening in our community through the public process that takes place because all of these projects have to have a public process. You know, going up to them and saying, we live in this community, we're an organization, we want to be a, a part of this. This is something that's new to our neighbors. We're hearing some, you know, um, objection to this. Um, this is something that we have that happens on a regular basis within Mattapan because now there are um, infrastructure changes and things that are happening. So it's it's a matter of having folks that are comfortable and, and, and going up to them and saying, we want to we want to help you with this process. We want to get our neighbors more involved. How can we be that bridge to help with that? Um, also, when the, the grants are written, there's a lot because of what's happened in the last year and because of Black Lives Matter and because of all of the systemic racism that other folks are becoming aware of, I'm finding that these organizations are more open and willing to say, let's work together. So I think this is the right time to make the, you know, to, to approach them and say, if you want this to work, we need to be a part of it. And, and funding has been provided um, to neighborhood groups, to individuals to be able to do that. That was a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> no, all right. Um, and there actually is another question for you. Um, a little bit further down. I see it. From Sarah? Uh, yes. Yep. Um, from Sarah. Um, interested in your thoughts about respecting the wishes of the local community versus overcoming initial resistance uh, to implement a project that will ultimately be embraced. Seems tricky to know where that line is, especially if the community isn't fortunate enough to have leaders like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, what I have found is that, and this is all communities, folks that, that are planning and that are um, engineers, they're not community outreach folks, right? They may be comfortable within their own neighborhoods to do that, but like in a lot of the transportation projects that we have happening in my neighborhood, the engineers, they're traffic engineers. They're not, I don't, they don't talk to people. So it is working with the folks that are at these meetings, finding folks and saying, and inviting people to come out to these spaces. Because what I found was a lot of my neighbors didn't even know this was happening. But I'm fortunate that I, I came from a family that was just very like, this is the community in which we live, let's get involved. Finding others, there's always gonna be somebody that is interested in this that may not know about that. And then you have them bring another person along. There's not a perfect answer to this, 
but bringing folks to this space saying, this is in your neighborhood. Did you even know? Oh my God, it's amazing. They fall in love with it. They want to be part of it. And then, you know, it's like, think of PTAs and things like that in schools. It's like somebody's interested in this because of their children or whatever, and then they join it and, and it grows. So, um, and yeah, there are always going to be issues, the property values, the gentrification, those things are all very real. There are benefits to having this project. And, you know, there's all these other conversations along this, but in, in outdoor spaces, we need them. And especially we had found that during COVID, the, the, the need to get out. If you're living in really dense communities and don't have those opportunities, you need to get folks out and involve them. All right. Great. Um, I'm going to go back to a question that was asked um, of Melissa that was answered uh, privately, but I thought was an interesting uh, bit of information, which is, um, Melissa, can you um, review what unceded territory means? Unceded territory, it means that we've never signed off our right to the land. So, um, some tribal communities have in fact had to do so depending on if the treaty was changed or if it was taken away in some how. So unceded means that we've never given away our rights is basically what it means in sort of layman's terms. Okay. If that helps. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, I'm gonna combine two questions and th these were for Kate. Um, so the two questions kind of together would be what prompted you or the EPA to do this study? How will results be used? And then to tack on another question, has this been done in Massachusetts? Uh, so why we did it is because, um, so we, we are scientists who focus um, almost primarily on just how humans are affected by changes in water quality. That's most of, most of what I do for my, my job um, is, and um, a lot of the discussion around that um, doesn't understand who the people are that are able to access water um, and why and, and, and if that was equitable. And so it was more that we were, um, it was trying to initially understand, um, it, we went into it as a, a genuine um, like research question. Like we didn't know that, that, that we, what we would find. You know, we, we kind of hypothesized it or we guessed, um, but we didn't know what we would find. Um, and so for us, it, it was a way of starting to understand um, who people are that are using um, different access points because that's who's affected by changes in water quality. That's kind of the fundamental core of the work that we do, um, in, uh, particularly in, the, in our Narragansett Lab in Rhode Island. Um, I don't know that anyone's done it for Massachusetts. Um, the closest study to this one that I, that I know of is in Korea. Um, it's not that um, there, the methods that we used, um, other people have used for parks. Um, and so we took methods that people had used um, for some relative access to parks. And then a study that was um, a little bit similar um, from Miami about access to four beaches. Um, and so we used methods from other places, um, but to my knowledge, um, it hasn't been done in Massachusetts, although um, it certainly could have been done. You have some really smart uh, researchers who do some very uh, great thinking. And so it's possible that other people have looked at it and I don't know about it. Um, I, there was a comment um, by Russ Cohen about uh, the difference between uh, coastal access laws in Massachusetts versus Rhode Island. And I know that a lot of people um, here are tuning in from Massachusetts. Um, just a note that in Massachusetts that um, the, the coastal property ownership goes down to the low tide line. So in some ways, uh, access in Rhode Island is a bit easier. Um, so I don't know if you wish to say anything about that or just to, to just note that for everybody. Not for the Wampanoag people. I, we, we, we can go the easement. We could walk right over that. But um, I don't know about, I guess, for others, that is the low tide mark has always been sort of the rule, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's see, wow, the questions are coming fast and furious. Okay, um, for any of the panelists, are there good interim metrics that convince reluctant residents that the final result would be a vital amenity to the neighborhood? Um, so um, I, I assume that's probably mostly to, to Vivian. Thanks. 
metrics. <laughs> <laughs> Anecdotal. <laughs> um, the Greenway Council just getting out there, you know, having folks, talking to people on the trail, <clears throat> organizing events. One thing that I, I failed to mention is um, the EPA is looking at a part of the Neponset River um, for super funds. So when that, to be part of the Superfund program, when those public um, messages went out, a lot of the community was all concerned out. You know, they came out to these meetings, they wanted to know. That's another way, an unfortunate way to get to build awareness of what's happening. So our partnership with NEPRA, um, they've been wonderful in coming to neighborhood associations in Mattapan and talking about really basic things that we can as individuals do to help with the health of the river. So it's it's just creativity in different ways, but as far as measuring metrics, we're not out there counting to see how many folks, there's a lot of awareness that's now becoming, you know, folks are becoming aware of it and what it is that they can do. Um, but as far as we're not, we're not counting anything necessarily. We've done some surveying and things like that, but um, it's just spreading the word, a lot of word of mouth. All right, we have one more question, um, which I think is a great concluding question. Um, for all of the panelists, which is um, where we are, I would assume many of us, we are in communities that are close to the water geographically. So the challenge isn't access in that way, but other ways, primarily not feeling welcome or safe. Um, to just uh, even if water is less than a mile from your house or perhaps even in your backyard, how can we break down other barriers? <laughs> I know that's a big thing to tackle in, in a, a minute or so, but how can we break down other barriers besides geographic? That's a hard one to answer. I think it's an end of, you know, I think we yeah. have to look inside ourselves to kind of create those, to figure out those barriers, right? And uh, if you're a private property owner, and it depends on where the question's coming from, you know, if it's where, you know, what's the lens you're looking through while asking is sort of how I would see that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that uh, to sort of, uh, sort of wrap up uh, in a way, um, you know, I think that that is, is what all of this has been about and what, what we're continuing to work on. Um, you know, we've heard lots of different perspectives on access rights, whether it be possessiveness from misunderstanding or um, a lack of education about what the actual rights are or veiled or blatant racism or even uh, physical distance. Uh, but it's been great to hear some success stories um, and all of the work that everyone is doing as well as um, all of the work that is still needed. Um, and as was noted, much of that work is social work. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, we're gonna wrap up session two. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our panelists uh, for their wonderful presentations. Um, our next session, our next uh, part of this workshop is next Wednesday, same time, same place. Um, and it's on promoting environmental justice, the first steps in which uh, all of us will be taking our first steps toward implementing environmental justice by learning key terms and definitions and how to have authentic conversations about racism and ways to implement anti-racist practices. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to join us next Wednesday for the third and final session of our environmental justice workshops and enjoy the rest of this nice day. Thank you for attending. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Peace.